hey, there's a need for me to improve my life. Uh, is, is there any constant of uh, physics or any law of thermodynamics or uh, like uh, physics and something fundamental of the universe that has to be violated for you to make that realization out of this expression? Uh, I don't. I don't think uh, that 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 has to be the case. I, I had the, made this realization in the past, so uh, I want to make a very optimistic comment that. Maybe this is the thing that makes people realize. And in principle, there's nothing avoiding that. So whether these utterances that I'm making are the things that will end up changing the life of someone who's listening to only depends on how they take it. So now it is in the hands of the people listening to these things I'm saying to whether they actually want to start changing their life in the direction of virtue, you putting into a practice the alignment between feedback and reality that we have been talking until now or not. So it's very powerful that you can make an explicit comment of the change that could occur that in principle is not blocked by anything. I'm today accompanied by my friend Abdi. I met him in a Zurich stoic event and we have been both very eager to have a conversation with each other debating the existence or inexistence of free will for a while now and this is what has emerged out of that urge we had to debate what our positions were in this topic and we are now going to debate the relationship of free will with stoicism and a few other topics i'm sure that are also very interested related to philosophy and how to live a good life so yeah, Abdi, welcome to Escaping Mediocrity. Hey, thanks for having me. Do you think free will exists? Um, it's a it's a good question. I mean, like free will. I think um, if you have, if you have asked me this question like uh, maybe a couple of years ago, I would have said one hundred percent yes. But thinking more and more, I think there are there are a lot of influences. And uh, to quote um, William James, who was a philosopher. Um, he actually said that um, his first act of free will is to believe in free will. So I think free will exists, but you have to believe in it in order to work for you. So the process of believing in it would make it appear in a sense that I think that this is related to what the Stoic, Stoic philosophy says about how it is our your interpretation of the facts that determines a big part of the consequences of the facts not ac the actual things going on around you because your stress and your emotional response is caused by your interpretation of the things not uh, by the things themselves this is very in line with a lot of things that marcus aurelius seneca and epicurus said and what i interpret this to be relating to what you were saying even though i think that in some other way you, you're wrong is that believing in that you can change something increases your ability to change the things because the way you behave changes. If, if, I, if I think I cannot change my situation in a positive way, I would be like the rats in an experiment in which they experience electrical shocks without any hope of ability of avoiding them. So they, they weren't given any tool to avoid the shock and then they learned hopeless, hopelessness. Self-helplessness, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, like the, the I mean, um, this is also what uh, Marx earlier said that he said, you, um, you have power over your mind, not outside events, realize this. So you have, we have to realize, and I think this is free will, I think is also a self uh, responsibility in my view that um, a lot of people actually um, go away from, from, from this will to take actions, to take, you know, to, to make choices. And then they say, uh, you know, it was uh, d determined or predetermined by other things or they will blame their boss or th their, their girlfriend, whatever. So I think free will, I think, exists, but you have to grasp it, in my, in my, in my, in my view. How would you define free will? I think f I would define free will in a sense that um, you see different options and you decide by by uh, not something out by by not something that pushes you outside like like an outside force and you take uh, a choice deliberate and by your own um, by your own um, conviction conviction yeah. okay so it would be the ability to ditch a lower 
desire. Let's say I see a donut. This is the example I've always given in almost every episode from this podcast, which my audience maybe are fed up of listening to this example, but it's so good because it transcends the specific scenario of the donut. I don't care about the donut. It's just that we always face a dichotomy between doing the thing that feels good, but is not good, and doing the thing that doesn't feel good, but is good. And then there's things that are actually aligned with feedback, which would be the things that are good and feel good, and others that feel bad and are bad, like putting a nail into your head. That's not illegal because feedback is aligned with reality. But where I was going with the desire to do the thing that is actually right, resembling free will, is that your desire to do the thing that's hard but good in the long term is not something you can account for. You cannot explain why you had that desire. The the thing leading to your thought of, okay, let's work out and eat some pepper instead of eating a donut and staying in the couch watching TV. What leads to your decision has not itself been decided by you. The, what, whatever precedes the decision is something you are not aware of by definition. The previous to conscious is unconscious and you, ca- you cannot at all explain why that was the case. Maybe in a, you can explain it in the sense that you have been educated by your parents in a way, you have some friends which incentivize you to do certain behaviors and not others, but all of those things, your environment or, or your genes were not chosen by you. Exactly. And this is actually what I, what I read, um, you know, like uh, to prepare for this interview uh, because uh, I wanted to see the other side. And also I wanted to, to read, uh, probably you've heard of Sam Harris and uh, he's actually against free will. And he wrote, a, he wrote also a book about that. So I was like, okay, it's also good to see the counterpoint because in every debate um, you, you have to know like what does the other side believe or what does the other side think. Although, of course, I, I disagree with that, with that point. And I think um, what he said is exactly w- what you described, that um, we don't choose in what country we're born. We don't choose um, our genetics. We don't choose um, our environment, you know. But he also said, of course, uh, in this um, spectrum that he says that Choice ma- choices matters, but we don't get to choose what we choose. So this is his, you know, his viewpoint. But actually, I disagree with this point because I think if you are in an environment, let's say if you are in a bad environment, let's say in, in a toxic environment, or if you are like in a in an environment where there is uh, nothing that you know that impacts you positively, be it like in a physical or mental in a mental way, of course, then your free will is is being impacted. In, in a way that uh, you don't have you, you don't have the maybe the, the choices to do which aligns to what what you think w- will help you right but I think what we can choose is to exit this environment to change the environment to change the context and this is also you know a theme that uh, has been discussed a lot f- for the readers who know like atomic habits that uh, we are the we are the we are the, like the product of our environment so but also we are not only the 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 victim of our environment, we can be the architect. So we can, we can create like an architect, a new environment, and then this will also help us um, choose choose our choices differently. So I think we we are not only a, a victim in, in this mindset. So that's why I also disagree with this context. In order for a victim to exist, there would have to be a victor. Uh, there would have to be someone who perpetrates the abuse or the behavior towards whoever is rece- at the receiving end of this interaction and i think that's not the case there, there's only cause and effect occurring in the world there's not a single point in the interaction of particles which is violated by the laws of physics and even if we want into quantum physics that's that the randomness doesn't lead to the emergence of freedom the freedom that we believe to exist is one which I think you are making reference to, which is the ability to choose what is hard because it's good. It's not immediately gratifying, but you know to be the better option. Like, I don't know, taking care of your parents when they're sick, it's not comfortable in the moment. You would like to avoid it, but it's the duty that you have and you have to do it. So 
in some way providing for the people around you it could be instantaneously gratified by not doing it but it's a horrible decision so it could cost you uh, the best relationships you've ever had if you don't do it and this is just another example of the same dichotomy between the good decision and the bad one that we always face because the alignment between temporal versions of yourself is not perfect your, your future self cannot come here and tell you don't do this because i'm tangibly perceiving the consequences of your short-sightedness when you decided to eat, eat the donut and you're right in that we can change our environment at no at no point i'm trying to debunk or go against that i i'm the biggest example of the ability of someone to change the environment i i've moved from one country to another because i simply wanted to and i I, I'm doing things in a very deliberate way, which goes counter to the by default options, and that's something that that has emerged out of a desire to do things better. But do you think, like um, you mentioned, your your personal example? Do you think like you 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 could be a use case for free will because you exerted like free will and uh, did did free will lead you to Switzerland? No, I think that the concept of free will depend. I, there's a way in which you can define free will, and it, it would make sense to me. But it's, it's not the free will that most of the people talk about. The, the, and then there's the other type of free will, which cannot even be defined. The, the, the free will that cannot be defined is uncaused behavior, uncaused uh, outcomes. Like the, something has a cause and effect, so an effect that has not has a precedent, something that hasn't been caused. That is not something that computes. You cannot even make reference, you can make reference to that, that to that concept, but it's not something that registers in your consciousness because it doesn't make sense. It's like saying a round square. You can say that, but it doesn't mean that you are making reference to anything. And if you try to distill the essence of the logic behind your argument, what you were saying by, not you, but with free will in the purest form would mean is that uncaused behavior and there's never there's never something that's not caused and i'm reading now a book called determined by robert sapolsky which is the the science of life without free will that's the subtitle and it's so interesting because he points out to all the metabolic and biological pathways leading to your behavior now how you have incurred in certain directions at multiple time frames in your history the evolutionary pressures the upbringing that you were in, the kind of smells that you have been exposed to in the last hour or few minutes, the kind of stimuli visual that you have had in the last minute or few seconds, all of those things converge into your current version, which if any of those would be altered in some way, your behavior now would be changed because your predispositions to do certain things would be altered. And so that's a very cogent explanation of how free will doesn't even make sense, but Going back to the first example I gave about the other definition of free will, which actually makes sense to me. And if we are going to change the definition of free will to something that, to this, which I think is make, makes more sense, I would start supporting free will. And I think this is where we agree in that free will would be having the grappling of two sides of the, uh, the, a debate in your own mind, having the devil and the... And the um, The angel or the like, angel, yeah. yeah. The, the devil and the angel having both fight each other and having the angel win. Having the desire to eat the donut, but realizing that that's bad and still choosing to not do so. Yeah, I, I recognize that I want this, but I also recognize that it's bad for me. So that ability to grapple with the good and the bad and choosing the good is what we would conceivably start making sense of in terms of free will. Would you agree with me? I agree. I think that that's a. I think that's a great example because um, this would also apply to to what I think um, in a way that um, it needs. I mean, like to exercise free will, you need to have the ability, or as you said, um, um, more concise probably. With with you need to grapple with something. Of course, it, it can be something like minor, like uh, which ice cream you choose right now. Of course, but but also it can be to a more substantial, important, li major life decision. <clears throat> but I think um, the reason why I, I don't quite agree with um, with uh, with the other side is that I think 
things are predetermined. Let's say, uh, as we, dis- we discussed, we, we have, so some things have a uh, predetermined um, effect to us, but still we can choose how, how to react. And this is also like, um, if, we, if we focus on the stoic side, um, you choose your reaction. So things can happen to you, but you are not the victim of it. And that's why, I mean, victim not only like literally, but also figuratively that you can also... Um, and this is, I think, a behavior we can watch in, in a lot of domains. I mean, like some people work for the same company and uh, some are miserable and some are like really cheerful and are happy. So they are both in the same conditions or let's say prisoners, you know, so, some prisoners um, after they, they, they came out of prison, they, they are just um, going more, you know, continuing doing, um, you know, doing, doing bad activities. And some are actually um, having, having the lessons, learned the lessons and are actually um, pursuing a different path. So I think in that way, man, and uh, to quote, of course, Viktor Frankl, which um, I'm a huge of admirer, he said, the man does not some, simply exist, but always decides what his existence will be. So with that context, anyone can change in a given set of, uh, you know, in a, in a given set of way. So, and this is something I truly believe. And this is, I think, what society also needs um, to, uh, to hear. Hmm. I see what you were saying, which was very in line with what I was previously stating, that it seems like free will, we are framing it as an ability to overcome obstacles, um, metaphorically. There's also literal obstacles that you have to face in your life. But the what I was referring to with an obstacle is the desire to do something that's actually not good for you and the ability to oversee that thing from a distance and you can prevent the bad behavior from occurring by anticipating the vice or the bad behavior that you're going to be facing in the the, or at least the desire that's going to be lurking in your life so instead of reacting in a bad way to it you say okay there's two options of what I can do now. I've been offered uh, an ice cream, in this case, by a friend or by whoever. And you can choose either to consume it or to say no and stay in your stoic, let's say, state of neutrality and trying to think in a very rational manner, not being influenced by the lower angels of our nature. Or I don't know how to say it in a proper way, but there's differences between in which time frames things are positive the ice cream all of the benefit of the ice cream is concentrated in in the next 20 minutes or the next hour and all the costs are concentrated in the long term because the fact of you eating now the ice cream doesn't only affect your insulin resistance or the amount of calories that you're ingesting or whatever other variable we could think of also your money that you're spending, but, and this is the biggest point that I would like to make to make the biggest case towards virtue. And this is, I think, what the Stoics were talking and you were touching before, is that the cost of eating the ice cream is not in the ice cream itself or the consequences of the ice cream in the future in the sense of you've eaten this ice cream, now you have higher blood blood sugar. The real cost, 99.9% of the cost, is in the updating of what you are being used to that occurs in your mind. So now the fact that you have decided to eat this ice cream is changing the probability of you choosing the ice cream in the future. So if now you made the sacrifice, the amount of desire you would have towards the ice cream next week when you're again offered the same ice cream would be less so or a lot more i don't know i don't remember if i said that if you have accepted it or not so i think ditching it saying no decreases the odds of you choosing next time because you are getting used to that which you believe to be good and it is this precise point which i think is the only thing that matters in self-improvement once you realize that what you do doesn't only affect the moment but also the future in terms of your predisposition to do those things you start realizing that the cost of one vice is not isolated in that instance exactly i mean like uh, really you, you just raised a really great point i mean um, in a way i think um, this resembles uh, what, I, what i what i just read recently about um about that the future now i mean the future now 
is now. I mean, um, if we talk about our future self, we are actually now transforming into our, into our future selves. And, and there's actually um, current science that, that says that we actually have difficulty to imagine our future self. So, and we are actually suffering from what uh, people say, an end of history um, illusion. So we think we are already, I mean, we, we know if, if you ask just a, a random girl or a random dude, I mean, how much did you change in like the last five years? He will tell you, yeah, I changed a great lot. I, I you know, I changed my diet, my, you know, my goals, my, my working, my studies, whatever. But if you, if, if you ask like, okay, but how do you change like, um, or what is your prediction of how much you will change in the next 10 years? He will say, no, actually not greatly. So and I think that shows that we are actually lacking, you know, the, the, um, the visibility into our future selves, which is actually in a way dangerous because if you don't know, um, if you don't know what our future self is, so how can we actually prepare for, for the future self? It's like a government not knowing what their five-year plan is. How can they prepare the government or like the, their country for, 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 for the future? And I think this is a, this is a, this is a danger way, uh, dangerous path. And uh, I think one... One uh, one quote I read actually that uh, resembles this this issue is that um, actually uh, young adults pay a lot of money um, to get tattoos removed when young t teenagers get this uh, the same tattoos for a lot of money or um, young adults uh, rush to divorce when young younger adults uh, rush to marry right so there's always always an effect uh, on the future so. We, we, and, I, and I think this puts puts into the spotlight what we are doing now in the present. Yeah, the relationship between your present and your future self has to be taken into account. You are you're in yourself a community of people. It's you now, you tomorrow, and you in two days, and you in 20 years. And it seems very unified, the fact that there's a unique concept that you have to grasp in order to improve your decisions to the highest degree across all the levels of analysis in our life. If, if you just realize that there is time frame, a time frame problem in our life, that we are, as you said, not able to perceive the consequences of our behavior in the future and reasoning about this and thinking, oh, okay, is this sh sugar going to be good in one week? No. Okay, so let's say no to that. And if you just apply this rule of thumb to every decision you make, Will this be useful for me in one week, one year, five, 10 years? And you start real making it more tangible, the consequences at those time frames. Your decisions improve a lot and they can get to a point in which you're behaving in a way that channels all of your resources to your betterment as a person and you can become the best you can. And this is fascinating. And I find this also related to what you were saying, the end of history fallacy that I, I read about this also in a book. I don't remember which one, but I mentioned this to my father. I'm 21 and my father is 60 now. And I mentioned to him that I was reading this book and I re remembered the anecdote that the 20, 20 year old people change, believe they are going to change as much as 60 year old people actually change. So that, that's the magnitude of the bias. 60-year-old people change much less than 20-year-olds. But <laughs> the perception that what occurred in the past contains all the change changing that will occur in your life or a big proportion of it is just so wrong. Because obviously, the fact that you cannot think of what will occur in the future doesn't mean that the future doesn't exist. That's like the availability bias. You you ask a random drunk person in the street, why are you looking for your keys in, in the spotlight of where the public lamp is? And he says, well, because there's light here. And you ask him, have you lost your keys here? And he says, no, I lost them like a few a few meters in the other direction but there's no light there, so I cannot look there. So if you see it this way, it's obviously absurd. The fact that you cannot see doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, so you only look where you can see, but the the relationship, the correlation between what you can see and what actually matters is not perfect. And there's some things which you can see very well, the past, that's certain, you, it already happened, but it doesn't mean that the future doesn't exist even if you cannot see it. 
I agree. I mean, um, in a way, I think this is um, this shows why a lot of people are actually, you know, um, are actually giving into self gratification because I feel like if you are more attuned, and I think um, I, th I also listened to this uh, podcast which uh, which I talk about um, um, about your future self. And they also they also actually changed you know checked um, the the brain activity while conducting an experiment and the experiment was like people had to imagine uh, a random person <clears throat> and they checked the brain activity and compared it to when they were when they were asked to imagine their future self and they had the same activity and they concluded out of it that for us our future self is just a random person we have no idea about this person this is actually uh, really interesting. Because if we take this takeaway, we can see that um, if if there if our future self is a random person, why should we take sacrifices? Of course, I'm not presenting this point, but I'm just asking I'm asking this question because it it makes everything harder to you know let's say for people to to exercise to save money to um, to do something that will not give them the gratification right now in the moment. So I think this is the challenge. This is this is so analogous to a chapter from The Simpsons that I saw a few years ago. I watched it, it was Homer talking about how he's indulging in a in something bad, like eating beer, or, uh, drinking beer, or eating some junk food, or I don't know, spending a lot of money in something and not going to work, or like the, the most absurd of the behaviors possible. And March asked him, "What? Are, why are you? Why are you doing that? That's going to cause you a lot of pain." And he says, "Oh yeah, March, but that's a problem for the future Homer, and I really don't envy that guy." <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what you were saying the inability to identify yourself with something that still doesn't exist you're not taking care of that because you doubt its existence uh, exactly I, I mean I, I, I had to laugh because um, this Homer example actually um, is, is, is brilliant because this is also what happens uh, to us when we let's say um, or, or to people when, when they uh, binge watch or they, they stay up late or they procrastinate for their work they're like Okay, now I'm I'm getting I'm, I'm I'm reaping the rewards from the procrastination or from you know binge watching or eating junk food, but the consequences this is just a random this is just a random uh, person right, so for tomorrow so I think that I think that that's the dangerous about about uh, certain habits because the consequences are not in the moment, and also for good habits and bad habits I mean like you can you can study one hour Mandarin you can you can train one hour in the gym. And at the same time, you can also spend one hour, I don't know, gossiping or just uh, or just uh, wasting your time. And the effect will 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 both, in a way, not not happen uh, immediately. So I think uh, just just to have this long term view is, is important in all domains. I think this is the civilizational problem. There, there's no more problems in the universe than this. If you analyze it in the way I'm going to say now. The misalignment between feedback and reality is the problem. I think there's nothing else in the world that we can complain about. The illusion that things are in one way and are not, that's kind of the definition of illusion, is the ori originator of everything that's going bad. So I, I, I want to tie this up in the sense in relation to what you were mentioning of a uh, behavior which is bad for you in the long term in that the only reason why you would eat the donut is that the consequences are not symmetrically felt if you were capable of feeling the good and the bad of the interaction you are going to go into you would never do it because the cost is bigger than the benefit but the fact that it is asymmetrical, what you feel, and there's a difference between what you feel and what is, the misalignment between feedback and reality, is what leads you to be deluded, to f think that there's uh, something going on that's not actually true, that you are f fooling yourself into the illusion that this is good when it is not good. And we can even think of a, another example apparently disconnected from a vice which would ultimately be the same thing related to uh, a conflict between two people the, the reason why two people get angry at each other is that there is um, misunderstanding at some point and 
if we both had the same story, we both we would understand what went on and say, okay, I conclude that your behavior was rational according to your knowledge in the moment. And I understand that you did that. So let's try to change things from now on. And the same thing would be reciprocated from the other part. And then would say, what do we need to, to do now to compensate for whatever bad we did in the past? And let's try to behave properly in the future. That's, I think, morality in its essence. Anything else that's not this is complete bullshit. Whatever argument of morality someone can build that doesn't tackle this, it's just vapor. I don't see how morality cannot tackle I don't see how morality cannot be the interaction between the future, present, you, and others. It's spatial and temporal. It's how you affect others that's not as tangible. If you if you stamp on someone on the street, or you put your feet on top of the finger of someone who's in the floor, you don't feel the pain of the finger breaking in, in the same way that you would if it was your finger. So it is the misalignment which leads to the damaging of things. Of, and the same thing occurs with robberies. If the robber of a bank or a shop would be feeling in itself the same damage that he's causing, if the interaction would never occur. Because it doesn't make sense. Think of it. Would would you break the door of your house and then take money from you and risk the possibility of going into prison for that? That's just stupid. And the reason why robberies occur is that you don't have to pay for the for the door to be reconstructed, and you ha you don't have to assume the cost of having less money now. Exactly. It's it's just about not get, uh, not paying the cost, not paying the dues, and only getting the benefit out of it. Exactly. Yeah. And if you align the benefit with the cost, only good behavior exists. If you make the robber assume all the cost that he made assume the banker or, or, or the shop, he would never rob because it's like a neutral transaction. If, if I have to repay everything I do, I would stay as, as I was before, but now I'm poorer because I, I, break, I broke a, a door and I have less money because I had to pay for, for that. And they have given the money back. So it is analogous to a robbery. You are robbing yourself when you indulge in a bad behavior. Exactly. I, I, I would say you're, you're robbing. I mean, I would say um, your analogy of, of the robbery is uh, really interesting in a way that it points to the, to the core issue here. That um, you're actually robbing the chance for 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 something else to take in and for something that um, produces value let's say or, or or let's thinking and i think one of the core issues in a way that also um uh, influences free will if we can take a uh, if we can take a step back is um overindulgence and also um that nowadays we are just mass like bombarded with information I think in the past, I think it was it was difficult to make choices, and maybe you had to I don't know go to a different city and uh, to to counsel somebody. But now you can just uh, post something, and they're like, ah, what should I do? Ask Reddit, ask X, ask Facebook, ask your local group. And I think now we have an overload of opinions, and I think in a way that the overload of opinions uh, is also dangerous in a way that a lot of people are not actively, you know. Um, taking charge of their lives or taking action and instead are waiting for the perfect um, uh, opportunity and are asking like what is, the, what is the best way I could spend my 20s what is the best way I could start a business what is the best exercise so you, you always hear this best so and uh, I think one philosopher he said like the, the best is the enemy of the good so you have to start with something good you have to start something in order to become good at it so I think now we are also in a way that uh, uh, or actually, we are actually damaging ourselves instead of just putting one step after another, right? There was a book published by Barry Schwartz. It was called The Paradox of Choice. And he talked in this book that about the fact that when you have not many options, your decision is rationalized by you to 
match what you were expecting. And so you are satisfied. There, there's two kinds of shoes. You chose the ones that seem the most appealing for the price that they, they costed. And now you're happy because the other option most probably was worse. But now you don't have two options. You have more options than you could ever process even if you invested your your whole life expectancy w without sleeping or working or anything else to, to do that. So there, there has to be a trade-off between searching and exploiting. And this is one of the biggest things I've facing in my life, the exploitation versus exploration uh, dichotomy, that how much time, let's say you have 10, 100 units of resources to dedicate to either buying or searching for a product if you invest a hundred the hundred units in searching because every second you dedicate to searching is less time that you have available or less money that, because your money your, your time can be converted into money you haven't made the purchase so there has to be if, if the product cost 20 the worst case scenario would be one in which you invest 80 and you, you, you choose the next one you see because you, you have no more resources. And there was a book, I, I listened to a part of it, and it was fascinating because it talked about dating. It was algorithms we live by. It was trying to apply computer science to rational decision-making. And it was incredible. It talked about how in dating, you have a limited life expectancy or years in which you will be young and beautiful as... You are now because you're young so it's very limited the amount of time we have in life and especially in the good state in which you are we are now cognitively physically and uh, in all the variables that we can think of so how, how are we going to optimize the spending of this limited time in searching and finding the best mate we can and what this book speculates is that if you let's say have a hundred prospective partners in your life you, you could potentially meet a hundred people which is probably an overestimate given that it takes like a long time three years to get to know someone deeply let the what this book proposes is that the optimal strategy would be going through 30 something per people getting having a date with 30 people or, or something like that it, it was lower than 50 and higher than 30 i think and then from that exploration of the in the first period this is assuming a very negative scenario in which you could not recall people who you've said no to before so no exploration would be horrible so if you start dating one person and immediately you become you, you get into a relationship with that person that would be horrible because you you have no knowledge of how good or bad they are you have no benchmark to which you could to compare it but also spending your whole life looking for people and getting having the best benchmark possible and being being the person with the most experience in life of how to judge the worthiness of potential mates would also be worthless because you now have no more time to choose. So the optimal strategy, according to this book, is spending a third of your time searching, getting a very good idea of what features you appreciate and what the market actually offers so is it reasonable for me to expect to date a woman who is two meters 30 centimeters uh, no there aren't it will be like one in every 100 million people so it's probably not reasonable for me to go for that maybe i have to look for something more in the average in terms of height someone who is 165 170 160 something like that would be in 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 the chunk of the biggest chunk of population and the same thing applies to intelligence kindness whatever trade you're looking for if, if you want the, the one that the outlier which is the top in out of 100 million people i don't know how you can do that maybe bias in your environment because let's say you, you want to maximize how fit your prospective partner is you're not going to search randomly you're going to go to a group of people who are fit let's say we we do rock climbing or jiu-jitsu or whatever sport you can think of and the people there are disproportionately fit they, they are like maybe one out of ten the fitter of a random selection of people if you take out of ten the most fit they are equivalently fit as the average in the group that we're talking about of jiu-jitsu people who do who do it 
So I think following this trend of biasing your environment in the direction you want is incredibly powerful. And I wanted to finish now my point on how you have to invest some time in getting to know what is a good shoe or what is a good perspective made. Because if you don't have a model, the, the probabilities are that you're going to fail in choosing, but you cannot spend too much. So you should build a model with a third of your time and then choose the first one that's above a six in the benchmark you have built. What is uh, 10? What is the best person you've met until now? What is the worst person you've met until now? What is the average? So what is above average? In the first person who's above average that you meet, this is a method that these algorithms we live by book proposes. It's very interesting. No, it's, uh, I mean, you raised some interesting points. I mean, in a way, I can consider working with an, uh, with an analogy of uh, action and motion. I think um, if you spend, I mean, action nowadays in our society is commonplace. So, uh, I mean, you see people are doing a lot of actions um, throughout the day, throughout the weeks, month, and so on. But I think the right action is rare. I mean, the right action aligning to your values, to your um, To your, to your beliefs and, and also what, what you hope will bring you, you know, the, the happiness. And I think, in a way, if you spend, of course, if you spend a lot of time just in a, in a, in a let's say, motion, in, in a pre prepared state, you will always be a student. But of course, sometimes it's just good to take some practice and try it out in the real field. And, and this is also what, you know, for, for scientists do, you know, when they're, when they're after, after the theories, they, they go into, into the lab. And I think we can take this, you know, knowledge and also... Yeah, just go go into the real world and um, not only explore but also do something you know uh, with our time and uh, in a way it's the same thing as um, I mean you mentioned the the uh, um, you know the your findings in, in the dating field but of course we can also see this in, in let's say in uh, travel people nowadays you can, you can search about every country like thousands of things thousands of travels but sometimes you know um, in my personal life I just like to have some surprises and I think surprises are also good in life and this could also apply you know to partners and also to countries because if you already know everything about a country let's say and you go to the country and, and you are on the tour bus and you know probably better the country than the tour guide you are just going to be like super bored there and you're going to be like okay This fact I know, this happened in World War II, they are aligned in this way, this political party, this, and this history figure. And everybody in the, in the, in the bus is going to be, you know, in a, in a state of, you know, uh, thrilled and excitement. So, uh, so I think um, it's uh, probably my thinking that we also need this excitement and also this kind of surprise effect in our lives. But, of course, too much surprise is also not good, right? Let's say, I mean, you have a job interview in a company. It's good to ask them questions. But of course, so, some things you will just experience on the first day or, or, or afterwards, right? So you need, you need the base, you know, um, information. How is the company? How is the structure? How is, like, uh, how is, the, how is the communication? But uh, sometimes I feel like knowing too much also is not so good because uh, you will at some point experience uh, it in real life what it means, you know, to, to be in a spot, to be in a country or a company or to be with a, with a significant other, right? Aristotle was talking about this like 2,000 years ago. He made, he made the statement that virtue is in the, between the two extremes. So every variable we can think of, if you take it to one extreme, it's bad. And if you take it to the other extreme, it's bad also. Too much water kills you. Too little water kills you. Too, my, too many push-ups kills you. Too little push-ups kills you. <laughs> I mean, maybe you can do zero, but arguably whatever other exercise you do is partially a push-up so if you take exercise to zero you would die so i guess that it also applies to this example and the mean or the point the sweet spot between the two extremes how to find that is very hard and when we have features of our world which are double-edged swords like exploring versus exploiting how much to do of each one It's very hard to calibrate to perfection. And I guess that you, we have to apply a meta pattern of detecting the best behavior to our behavior in the sense that you start behaving, you, you start doing things randomly and you see how the world works. And out of that, you build a model of how you should update update your model in the future it's kind of very meta but you don't only learn of how to behave in the future but also about how much you could expect to learn in the future so how much am i learning the fact that i go now in the street and i meet people updates my model of how extraordinary people can be 
and it's the model that is updated, but also the meta model, the model you have about the model of how much surprise can e exist. And this is also related to the fact that we evolutionarily humans were foragers, foragers of information. We were constantly looking for other information, trying to match patterns and build out of that something that could improve our situation. You could understand how something works and you can kind of tweak it to make it work better. But now, after 200,000 years of deprivation of information, we are, thanks to Moore's law, the exponential decrease in the space occupied by each transistor makes our computation be extremely powerful. And I, now I have a, a laptop which is it ha, which, which has more storage than it would occupy to have 100,000 books. I, I could have that in my laptop. Uh, and that's not, it would be like 100 gigabytes. This enormous difference between what the amount of information we can access to now and the one we could access before makes information less valuable and what reigns over the raw data you are facing is the ability to choose which information. Exactly. I mean, you raised in the beginning um, this analogy being uh, in a shop and choosing between two shoes. Now, I think in our world, we are choosing between uh, thousands of stores, right? So, and uh, even today, when I was just walking uh, Sundays through uh, Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich, you'll see people um, looking at the, at the windows and like, ah, oh, what, what should I buy? What should I buy? And, and uh, I had to wonder and, and uh, think, do we, do we need to think about it every time, right? So... Is there not like a, like a pause or something? Because uh, as you said, like uh, information, even though like it's Sunday, through the windows you can see the things that um, that, that are probably looking enticing to you. You, you will see um, commercials. So I think you you I think as humans I think we need time to also you know uh, to have this kind of like solitude and also think about our models, right? Because. So some people are actually working with models they have maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, not updated, right, um, to, to what they actually now believe or what they think or what they should do now. And they are still working with, uh, you know, um, uh, outdated models and doing things which they probably would have liked 10 years ago, five years ago, but is not bringing them any more happiness because they, of course, have an updated model. I think this is really important to actually uh, know oneself, right? I think this also helps you to to know what what you what you want to do at the moment, because uh, we we talked before about uh, future self, but I think it's also reasonably important to know what you like, what you dislike, you know, because of course we we have we, we are um, you know we are in an environment that says a lot of things, you know, and uh, are influencing in a lot of directions, but it's equally important to just step one, one, one time back and think, um, what are my beliefs? What do I think? What is, you know, about uh, morality, about ethics? And also to think um, what you should do with your time. Because I think now, we, we, I think of as humans, we are in a predicament that, of course, our ancestors were never really thinking about future self and about what, what should I do in five years? This is just now the standard question in every job interview, right? How do you see yourself in five years? This was not asked, you know, hundred years ago because in hundred, like a couple of hundred years ago, five years was was a long, long time. But now it feels like just uh, it feels like tomorrow, right? So, in a way, I think it's important to just um, to be mindful and to know what you know uh, what what is behind 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 everything. I, I think we sh we should be more. Uh, we should be more asking questions, questions about ourselves. Why do I like this stuff? And then I think we can go back and, and then trace uh, our likes, our dislikes and update, you know, update our models. Yeah, in, in line with what Sam Harris uh, saw or sees morality is that he says that morality is an application problem. It's about uh, uh, what behavior in the future will be maximizing human flourishing or, or the well-being defined in the most general way. I think this is perfectly right. And what you were mentioning about the 
ability of our society to conceive of long ter- longer time frames th- than we could before. This is because it is required to have a successful civilization. I like thinking of the analogy of a car. Let's say you are with your car in a field w- moving through the surface of of where you are traversing through. Let's say you are in a landscape and you, you're trying to go forward and there's obstacles that you have to avoid. If you take the path which is the steepest hill so you, that you can go the fastest, or this would be analogous to the most instantaneously gratifying thing because you don't have to spend hydrocarbons in fueling your car. You can just keep use the inertia of the gravity. Uh, this is a horrible example probably, but uh, you will not behave in a proper way because the the way you should behave in this instance of, let's say you, ha- you are moving around your environment and you are seeing what to do, the farther you can see your uh, a rock uh, approaching you as you move towards it in your car, the more capable you are of avoiding it. If it is 100 meters away, it's easier to swerve and avoid it than if it was 5 centimeters away. And that difference between how easy things are to avoid, depending on how far you're able to see, is the exact same phenomenon occurring in all the other examples we gave before, that ultimately morality is a matter of seeing your future, being able to see into the meters that you're going to be traversing. Maybe you cannot see perfectly. You cannot make a perfect prediction. I don't know what will happen to me this evening. I don't know what I will do. I don't know who I will meet. And that doesn't mean that I cannot build some things which statistically will be better. If if I do a workout, no matter what I will face this evening, I will be better off than if I didn't. Or if I'm follow if, if I read a bit more of Determined by Robert Sapolsky on average out of 1000 universes of my lives uh, out of a thousand lives of mine in 999 I would be better off than if I didn't so I think morality is a systematic choosing of the thing that improves your life in the most possible scenarios so the fact that you make a decision and it doesn't lead to a good outcome, doesn't mean that the decision was bad. Because let's say you are doing something which has a high risk of losing, but if you win, the win is disproportionate to the risk. So out of, let's say, five times that you do it, you would be losing four times. But maybe the fifth one, you win. So this would be analogous to approaching a random cute girl in the street. I find this, if, if you reason about it, it doesn't make sense that people are not willing to do it. It's just, if, if you find someone attractive or interesting or whatever variable you want to put into this equation, the, the only rational thing to do, well, depending on your, on your circumstance, if you happen to be free, is just going there and saying, hey, excuse me, I find you to be interesting. Would you be willing to have a coffee and just discuss a, f- a few things? And if they say no, that's perfectly fine. You, you respect other people's right to not want to hang out with you. But if they say yes, there you have a possible date and a potential interesting partner to cohabitate with. <laughs> so this is maybe a very autistic way of framing it because I'm taking all of the emotion out of it. But, but I, ultimately, it's what it is about. I think um, I think uh, the samurai, like the, the Japanese samurai, one um, one of them actually summed it up really well in a way that uh, we as humans have an observing eye and a perceiving eye. The observing eye sees what just is, right? So I'm just walking on the street. I'm, I'm seeing like, a, uh, you know, um, a, a, an attractive girl or or just, um, or just, or, or I'm hearing about business opportunity or I'm seeing like um, a good, a good way to do something. But the perceiving eye sees more, what it is there, right? So the perceiving eyes brings the obstacles, brings um, brings the you know um, brings the issues to the fight. Although the fight or the goal has, hasn't even started, right? So he said like the and the difference between the observing eye and the perceiving eye. The observing eye is strong. So when you see something, this is like our first instinct. You see something, you're like, okay, this is this. Is, I feel strong about this, and I should probably do this. But then enters the perceiving eye, and the perceiving eye is like, oh, don't do it. 
in the example of the of the girl, maybe the perceiving eye will say she has a boyfriend or she doesn't want to be bothered. Or if 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 you if you hear about business opportunity, you're like, yeah, you're not skilled at the moment. Or if you hear about the career opportunity, you will say, ah, uh, maybe this company is too um, too um, I don't know um, too uh, um, high entrepreneur high entrepreneur or they, they they expect different you know uh, traits from me which I which, which I don't um, compass um, at the moment. So it's, I think it's I think this is a fight we face in 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 a lot of situations, and I agree with this you know with this uh, with this uh, samurai quote that um, the observing eye actually is the solution, but the perceiving eye is actually the issue that uh, prevents us actually sometimes from from action and brings us to inaction, which is just that we have opportunities and we see like the buses or uh, you know the 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 things we, we we could go on but the perceiving eye is just like no wait for the next opportunity and then maybe the next opportunity doesn't come in that way yeah and the fact that you pass on this opportunity because just because of fear of being rejected makes you more k- prone to passing on the next one so you're not only passing on one you're passing on one point something or or a few or three or five or i don't know how many you're passing by making the instantaneously gratifying decision now of not facing your dem- demons of and p- potentially being rejected, which you don't want to, because it updates the model you have about your own self worth. Because who gets rejected if it's not someone who's little, who has little worth? But that's completely wrong because most of the people get rejected when they offer other people to to do something. Uh, and, th- and this creates, a, I think, this this creates also a dangerous cycle because uh, let's say in the domain of dating now we have a lot of like um, a lot of men who are actually. Uh, angry at women or uh, who are fearful of women or who are just um, just because uh, they were just rejected once like 15 years ago and st- instead of just uh, shaking it off like uh, let's say if we uh, and I think this is this is something that um, confuses me because if we get rejected I mean everyone probably was also rejected uh, by a job offer but we never said we never said like ah oh, I never want to work again work is, work is evil and uh, I hate work still you would just uh, apply for the next job if, if you get onto that job you will just start working and you forget about the, the other rejections sooner or later right but this doesn't apply to other domains right so and uh, in some in some it, it could have really like um, a lot of like bad uh, re, re uh, percussions that uh, if you don't shake this off and continue to use this as a, as a benchmark and say see this is what I this is what I knew was going to happen, and this is also a dangerous way I think, uh, which 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 uh, doesn't help uh, in in self improvement or just in becoming uh, a better person. The, the rejection doesn't point necessarily to a lack of good traits in you, or not in the future, because it it only says that now is not a good moment for uh, maybe the, the, there's not a match between what your skills and the job offered, or there's not a job offer at all, and you're just saying, hey, can I have a job in your company? There's many reasons why you would not match a situation, and most of the situations wouldn't match. That's why we are in one place and not in seven simultaneously. And the same thing applies to dating or whatever other realm in which human cooperation has to occur, And it's just absurd that the same thing that we think is justified to be done when you are rejected instinctively, like the the ego tells you to, okay, a woman has said no to me, so fuck them. I'm not going to talk to a single one more in my life because they are disgusting. And this is just so wrong because it, it, it just means that it wasn't appropriate in the moment, but if, if you keep just doing it, you will improve in your approach and you will become more appealing. And if, if, you, if you just do it enough, at some point you will learn and you will be able to attract something, someone worthy of you. Exactly. I think we, we need to take numbers into equation because I think when, when emotions take over, it's, also, it's, it's always good to take, um, it's, al- it's, it's always good to take facts and also numbers into the game. And I mean... If if somebody said, uh, you know, um, in your example that yeah, I encountered like two two women and they rejected me and now um, I want to stop uh, talking to them and th- there are actually communities in the world that actually have these beliefs, uh, which is pretty unreasonable because if you compare that, let's say you expect uh, you encounter two Spanish guys or two Polish guys, and of course you don't have pro- perhaps the best, uh, uh, you know, perhaps the best communication or. Uh, you know, uh, connection with them, and you're like, ah, screw Polish and Spanish guys. I will never speak to Polish and Spanish guys. I mean, how absurd is this, right? 
and the people actually are using this and in in a lot of lot other domains right they 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 have um, let's say they have um, two bad experiences with um, let's say um, uh, people of color or or people that let's say uh, Jews or Muslims and they're like ah these people are evil I have um, and this is also dangerous in a way because it, it confirms our bias because if we have a um, and uh, if we already have a, uh, a bias about certain communities or certain people or or even genders and something happens which is negative this confirms our bias because then we are like even stronger in our bias we're like ah see I knew women or this kind of group they are like uh, against me and then I think this this creates this uh, um, us versus them uh, you know uh, mentality which is extremely dangerous in 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 a, in a fabric of society right and if you realize it, it is the believing that Polish or Spanish people are stupid which makes you behave in a way around them which makes them behave in a way around you which you would consider to be stupid uh, if you treat people as, the, as if they are stupid, they are going to treat you as if they were stupid. Because if you, a big proportion of the way you perform is the expectation other people have on you. So I, I've, I've noticed this with a lot of people. The people who were expecting me to say stupid things and they, they were saying, oh, whatever this guy says is completely worthless. I, I've noticed that my performance in, the, in that environment is very low or, or lower than it could be because they are one expecting me to fail and and you say something that doesn't make sense and in the other hand the pressure that is put on me because the, my turn in speaking is not respected at any point they can interrupt and what what can i do afterwards i can say i haven't finished my point but okay your point is doesn't deserve being finished because you, what you say is worthless and i'm not saying that there's anyone in 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 the world which is this bad i'm just trying to take the example to the extreme to point towards something which exists always it's there's a spectrum of how much performance is going to be expected from you in the people around you and the more it is expected the more that it exists and if you believe that polish or and spanish people are stupid the, w the way you're going to approach the interaction will make them behave in a way which then you will consider to be stupid and if you just went neutral towards them and rejecting your a stereotype which is most probably wrong the way they will behave will be completely different and this destroying of negative stereotypes and would wouldn't argue for the destroying of all the stereotypes maybe the best stereotype would be a positive one believing that people in general are kind intelligent capable and just approaching people as if you have a prior of expecting competence in others treat others as if you had something to learn from them and if you do that you will have more to learn than if you didn't approach them in that way. And you, so the, your expectation of the competence in others is the thing building the competence in others because they wouldn't perform at such a high degree if you didn't expect that. And I think this is something we can, we can, um, we can learn or something we can actually build um, within ourselves because uh, we are actually giving away the energy because um, if I go to Spain or if I go to, to Poland and if I speak um, to, to people from, from those countries in a way that... Uh, uh, gives away disrespect or gives away lack of lack of interest, I would probably receive a negative uh, response. But if I go to Poland and uh, speak some basic Polish and I say hello and uh, uh, where is this restaurant or or, or uh, likewise the same in Spain, I will probably gather a more uh, positive response. I think positivity is not is not always that everything is going to work out well, and I think this is this is why I consider myself. Uh, uh, a rational optimism that you would think things in the future, of course, the long term is going to turn out well, but the the short term is filled with a lot of uncertainty, with a lot of issues, and you will need to navigate one at a time, but uh, the long term course is in your favor. And th this is also what I take away when I travel, of course. Uh, some people, of course, even in Switzerland, especially when, when something happens in the travel, they will just uh, post a picture to the newspaper and like, ah, see, I'm trapped in this country. It's not, or this ATM is not working. But in some countries, this is part of what makes a country interesting. It's not like uh, in Switzerland, like a clockwork, everything working, everything expected. And sometimes I think this, um, this uh, surprise or this um, expectation is w what hinders us, right? So, and this is also um, going back to the Stoic philosophy is that... Um, um, that our expectation hinders us 
in a way that um, sometimes we are not harmed by by I think this was a quote from Seneca that we are not harmed by what happens to us but by but by the expectation we take from it right so I think this is uh, really important uh, to have to have in mind no one can offend you without your permission if if I don't want to be offended I will not be offended so there was another quote which was uh, you can measure the size of a man by the size of the thing that makes him angry if if you just get angry at the pithiest of the things you're not a big person you're, you're just a pithy thing uh, you're a pithy person because who gets angry at pithy things if it's not pithy people and if you just maintain the calm and rationalize that okay this went wrong let's keep doing the same thing because i think that what i was doing was right but it's just that it's improbable that we'll get we get it right the first time Let's just keep approaching cute women or intelligent persons or potential business partners or whatever variable you can, you want to maximize in this case. And this requires a stubbornness that says fuck you to every negative feedback you got because you think that your model doesn't need to be updated. And there's a trade-off here. There's a trade-off between dogmatism and being open-minded. And you have to use both because... You cannot just say, I'm going to be open-minded and I'm going to accept every new thing that comes into my perception and everything will be good. The, like the relativi relativism taken to the extreme. That you're constantly updating all of your models to the de biggest degree and that's completely useless. You, 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 you have no theory of anything. You're just saying, whatever is told to me today will be the thing that I believe today. That's like following the news. And in the other side of the spectrum, you have like the most eternal wisdom of meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And it's a book written like 2000 years ago. And people still read it because there are some very, very deep concepts of the human nature in that book, which haven't changed and will not change in another 20,000 years. People will keep reading it. I'm pretty sure about that. And in the other side, so the, the cost of reading Marcus Aurelius is that you not, you don't know the latest development in CRISPR or whatever cool technology in artificial intelligence has been developed or anything of relevance in, in the near term. You, you don't, you're, not sensitive, you're not sensitive to those. So we, we kind of have to grapple with the duality of appreciating the longer time frames of thousands of years and the wisdom acquired by humans in those time frames, which is massive, and simultaneously being able to update those models in some way, because our current understanding of how the world works doesn't align perfectly with what people were saying 2,000 years ago. And up acknowledging this requires the updating of the model, but not infinitely. There has to be a sweet spot of how much you dogmatically say, I don't give a fuck if I have been rejected. Okay? I, I think that the reaction now is not a predictor of my future interaction. So I will approach the next person and I will try to be happy and talk with them as if they were a very interesting person and let's see how it turns out that's that's a stubbornness I think stubbornness in a way and also I think it um, it's uh, resilience you know because in, in a way you can say um, uh, I think uh, I heard uh, that uh, the author of um, Thinking Slow and Fast uh, Daniel Kahneman was actually one time asked by his um, co-author co why um, he had some difficulties. I think in a way he, he was uh, preparing um, uh, a specific paper and the, the evening before they, they had a lot of difficulties and they had to rewrite a whole, a whole sections of the book. And the next day uh, his co-author came into the office and he asked Kahneman, like, how? Like, um, I can see that you're already writing a new chapter. Like yesterday was not happening. And he said like, and his, his response was really um, you know, powerful. He said, like, I have no sunk cost. Wow. And this is really powerful. And, uh, of course, for, for the people who don't know, sunk cost is a, is a bias that we, we, we all have as humans. And it's a bias that um, we continuous invest in, in activities or in, in investments that are actually um, not, not helping us further. And sunk cost, because, of course, we are just putting cost toward it but there is no benefit and instead of just saying okay i just uh, i just have that i just abandon it let's say you take a, a bad path or a bad uh, 
uh, trajectory in your life or let's say you go into a bad relationship or to a, to a, to a bad company, you, you can still abandon it, right? So I think this is also um, the... Uh, this is also the responsibility of taking, um, uh, you know, taking action because uh, otherwise you just continue and then they, you just sunk cost, cost, and then will it just end? If John Minor Keynes got something wrong in his whole career as an economist, is this phrase? He was poked by Hayek, I think. I'm not sure about this. I should be maybe fact checked that he was changing his opinion about something, and they were telling him. Well, you know, see who's now changing his opinion. Isn't this funny that you believe one thing and now you think other other thing? And he gave a brilliant response. He said, when my evidence changes, my opinions change. What do you do? And it was just a perfect response to, to that. Obviously, I changed my opinion and my mind because I now see other things. I, I this, this was my model previously. I had seen... A lot of Spanish people treating me badly, and I started seeing others treating me well. So I believe that Spanish people were disgusting, and now I am starting to believe that they are not. So maybe I should change my mind based on future evidence. And this was a very reasonable response given by, by this guy who got uh, the whole of economics wrong. But uh, you have to give the devil its due. There's very smart people who got get a lot of things wrong, but some things right. And taking those nuggets of gold is very important. Yeah, and I think it takes a lot of uh, humility and uh, a lot of like... Um a lot of dignity also sometimes to just say hey to, to put your hands up and say i was wrong right and um and i think this is this is also happening now of course with uh, with football w with the introduction of the vr that the, the referee is actually giving one decision away and then looking at the vr and then like hmm actually not and, and reversing the decision so why should we not uh, implement this in our uh, own life like uh, okay not like in a vr we, we don't have <laughs> we don't have a tv uh, Back in our mind to, to 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 replay some actions like in football, but we can still do the same thing. And uh, yeah, just having this uh, introspective um, um, communication with within ourselves, and then be like, hmm, maybe I acted wrongly. Maybe I should go, go to the person. I'm like, hey, ex uh, excuse myself, or uh, or maybe I should uh, um, I should not uh, propose to this job and just uh, take my, my take my CV back and just yeah, put decide uh, later on that uh, this was not a path for us and then avoid sunk cost, which is, I think, a really dangerous uh, way, in a way, to live by by something that happened a long time. Just continue to invest, invest, invest. And this is just a waste of time at the end of the day. Yeah, avoiding the sunk cost is good, but you cannot take it to the extreme because if not, you would be a completely moral relativist in the sense that whatever new evidence comes is the thing that will determine all of my models. And that's also bad, but I think the, this is ultimately the same as Stoicism. The, there's a quote, uh, that I think it was said by a uh, theologian, but it nails down to one phrase, what Stoicism is. And I want to read you the quote, it's the serenity prayer, maybe you already know it. It's, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. If you just acquire a bit more of serenity, courage, and wisdom, that's the solution to absolutely everything. And ultimately, what we're talking about here is aligning feedback and reality. It's making sure that what you feel like is what things are like. And once you do that, your behavior is only virtuous. It's, and you avoid every vice, because... Every, every advice you can think of, for example, treating others badly. Why are people rude with each other? Because it feels good in the short term. Like you are, it's like a show off of capability. I'm, Dominance, I'm, perhaps. Yeah, you're, you're kind of, exactly. You are kind of dominating over the other person because you are signaling, hey, check how much I can afford treating you badly. Because I don't care about what you can do. If, if, we, if you're going to have a conflict, I'm willing to go into a fight. So that's the implicit message in treating others badly. And it's completely bonkers. It, and it doesn't make any sense because it's instantaneously gratifying. It's, it feels good to do that. But it's the complete wrong approach. You, you really don't want to have a conflict with someone physically. And the implicit message of treating others badly, if you 
go two steps farther logically from what treating other another badly or rudely means is that I'm willing to fight with you. That that's just absurd. You cannot go through life with that mindset. Even if you're the strongest and most capable person in the world, you cannot beat seven billion people into submission. So power, ex exerting power over other people is not the way to win. So only kindness can escalate. Yeah, and uh, before you mentioned about uh, stoicism, I think um, it was Epictetus who said that um, freedom is um, freedom is the only worthy pursuit and freedom is won by disregarding everything which is outside of your control. And I think we live also in, in a world that um, people focus too much on, on, on things they, they cannot change. You know, people complain in the internet that they are too short, that they are bald, that they are, you know, always kind of like in this victimized uh, mode. But of course, you cannot change You cannot change your size. Of course, you can go to surgery, but not, not straightforward. Uh, of course, you can change your hair in a certain way, but not, um, not fully. But I think accepting reality... And I think um, there's a brilliant quote uh, from uh, from the Voltaire, the French uh, philosopher. He said, "Life is like," he said, "like uh, every player gets a cart, and every player must choose what um, uh, what cards to play in order to win, or in order to win the life." But you have to accept the cards. And he said, like, everyone gets different cards, and we can imagine this. You know, everyone is born into a different family. Uh, different economies, different uh, countries, different, uh, you know, uh, families, whatever. But still, you have to choose, you have to look at your cards, you have to open your cards and look, okay, but how can I move on with these cards? Like, what are, what, what are, what is my possibilities and uh, how can I proceed? But if you complain, imagine you are playing a cards of game and you complain the whole game about your cards and the, the game is finished. What have you achieved? And this nothing. is, I think, nothing, right? And this is, I think, um, what, what a lot of people are doing, just complaining, but not playing their cards, just getting getting ahead, getting on with something. And again, here, what is happening is the same thing that occurs when you treat others badly. It is the instantaneously gratifying nature of complaining. It's, oh, it's such shitty weather, it's raining, or even... Well, any complaining is analogous to this. There's some value in communicating your bad state so that others can notice it and help you if they can. But there's also a moment of that being converted into mental masturbation because you're always complaining and you're not doing anything. And I see morality as a way of pulling the levers of change. What Whatever you can change, you can call it a lever. And so you're pulling the levers in a direction which is good for us or for humanity or the, the, the universe in the most possible way. And one of the levers we have is blaming others. And I don't know, if that this is an argument with which I don't know if I completely disagree with Robert Sapolsky from the, this book I'm reading, De De Determined, which is very brilliant, but in this specific area, I think I disagree with him, in that blaming others for what they did is not justified. This is the hypothesis that uh, Robert Sapolsky has. And I disagree with it because blaming people for their bad behavior is partially what changes the behavior in the future. So let's say you did something bad. You stepped over a piece of furniture I have in my house and it was very precious. So I say, hey Abdi, you're such a incompetent person that you cannot uh, avoid from stepping over the valuable furniture. And that negative feedback that you're getting will update the model of how much pain you would expect given the same behavior in the future. And that will change your disposition to do the same thing in the future. And by telling you the negative feedback, and I don't have to be that rude. I don't have to be rude in the sense of doing the stupid comment I, I did now of saying to you that you're incompetent. Instead of saying that you're incompetent, maybe you can say, I think you have been incapable of dealing with this situation and I think you should change it in the future. That, that would be like the most constructive way of doing it. And maybe you can make a, a, another comment of saying, I really think that in the future, given this, the same circumstance, you can behave better. But let's make sure that that happens because if it doesn't happen, I will do something that you don't like. 
Like, for example, oh, I will not hang out with you next week if you do that again or something like that. And so you align interests with what cost. Like, let's say you make me assume a cost and I make you, you know that if you do that, I will make you assume another cost. It's symmetrical. It's not disproportional because then there's uh, an escalation of the conflict. Uh, I'm just, if you make me assume a cost of my furniture of 100 francs, I will make you assume a cost of 100. And then you know that incentives are aligned. In the, in the future, we, we both want to make sure that the other person is as good as possible and doesn't lose anything in exchange. And blaming is productive in this way, that you can tell someone that they are doing something badly. And if, if that's not the essence of what blaming is, what is it? I would, I would say in a way that um, blaming... It's not a word I, w I would use. Let's say, um, let's say you're in a bus and um, a guy who is probably a little bit drunk is uh, standing over, uh, you know, a petite woman, and uh, if he gets, of course, too close, and you and you watch this unfold, if you don't say anything, you are actually accepting his behavior. So you're in the bus and you're accepting how close he gets to another, you know, uh, person and evading her private space. But just saying, let's say, hey, go not further or what are you doing? Maybe makes him also aware of what he's doing is crossing a boundary. So I think uh, in a way that uh, um, blaming itself is not the, 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 the fully solution. But of course, you have to get the attention of the person in order to correct the behavior or for them to understand what they are doing is not what it is expected behavior right and this also taps into escalation in that if you tell the drunk person in this example that he shouldn't be doing what he's doing he may be escalate he will maybe escalate the conflict he will not only invade the private space of this girl but he will also start uh, violently gesticulating and saying insinuating that he will punch you or something like that and the solution to this is making clear that any escalation of a civilized behavior, because you were being civilized, you were making a, a comment about the guy, hey, you're too close to this girl, I think. Why don't you just move a step away from her? You, you were being polite. You didn't trespass any social acceptable boundary. And if he escalates that conflict, the only proper response as a society is to escalate it one step farther, take that guy, kick it out of the bus and put it, put him in arrest by police and, and tell him, okay, what are you going to do now? Uh, what, what was your plan? Do you really want to fight? Okay, fight with the police people, not with random innocent people, okay? And if, if you make sure that everyone knows that uh, an uncivilized escalation of the conflict will lead to a symmetrical escalation of the conflict by the other side, no one would behave irrationally. But the problem is that if you do not have the ability to escalate it one, the, one step farther, let's say bringing the police to arrest that guy, or you simply <coughs> think that it would be too costly, the optimal way of dealing with this situation would be to shut up, allow the girl to suffer a bit for a while, because the alternative you, you fear would be to have this guy crazy and rampant through the, through the bus, punching people, and he would eventually get arrested, but because it's too risky, it, the, the best thing we can do is to allow him to harass the girl a bit. And maybe this is what goes on in many situations. And I think it's analogous to what could occur with Russia in the sense that if they are irrational enough, that there's a point in which any negative feedback you give me could be responded by a nuclear weapon, which I'm not saying they are that irrational, but if taking it to the extreme, like North Korea or something like a, a bizarre regime, authoritarian, any negative feedback you give me, any restriction of my ability to act in, in the world will be met with the highest level of ferocity. And that's too costly. Allowing you to behave as an asshole, invading Ukraine or doing something of less magnitude of, of tragedy would 
maybe I, I'm not positioning myself in this conflict particularly. I, I, the knowledge I have about what's going on there and what will occur is like uh, three orders of magnitude lower than what I would need to do a coherent argument about anything. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm making an explicit comment of my ignorance to make sure that I'm let people know that I'm not making taking a position in this debate. But maybe allowing the person to make a trespassing of what we consider to be socially acceptable would be good if escalating it one step farther would mean too much cost. But And then the solution to this would be to allow the drunk person to harass the girl, but when the girl leaves the bus or the drunk person leaves the bus, follow him, call the police, and make sure that he knows that what he did was wrong. And now in a safe space, in a, in a safe environment in which any violence will be met with a proportionate and competent response by the policeman, we can tell him that what he was doing was wrong. But until you have that safe environment in which more collateral damage will not occur, I think that the best thing we can do is just shut up and, and assume the cost. What, what do you think? I think it's a difficult point. I mean, I think it's a point that uh, you can do a lot of theory, but in the end, I think uh, it's not something... If you, are, if you are on that bus, I think it will depend on the conditions. It will depend on... Because I think as humans, we are dependent on the conditions. And if, if, you, are, if you are walking, um, uh, if you are walking, let's say, in a, in a, in a bright street uh, at, uh, at uh, 11 a.m., and somebody gives you a, gives you a nudge or, or or a shoulder, you are like, what the hell is wrong with you? But if somebody does that in a in a street where a lot of party goers go, you think, ah, oh, this guy is just drunk. So I think t the timing and the conditions and also the context of the situation matters a lot. The shoulder bump is the same thing, but because you know, okay, this is probably just um, regular here, or that he hasn't seen me, or he was just drunk, it's the same. So I think in a way, people would behave, I think, differently. Uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. If, if the bus is full of people, so people um, would tend probably to have this, um, uh, I think it's called, um, uh, I think it's, a, it's in psychology it's called um, an effect when a lot of people are there. And, Claustrophobia. Uh, no, I think it's um, bystander effect. Yeah, I was looking for bystander effect. So a lot of people are there and people are just thinking, yeah, somebody else is going to deal with this. So a lot of uh, another bystander will deal with this. So either that will happen. This is something we, we can we can watch in, in big cities. If somebody cries for help, people are just like, yeah, maybe he needs help. But I'm a little bit busy. So the person behind me will, will help. And all the people cumulative have the same thinking. So nobody's going to help them. Right. So I think. In the context of this example you, you raised, I think it, it really depends on the timing, on also the confidence level and also on the skill level uh, of the person. Because if it's a person who has a, who has a you know, background in, let's say, uh, in, in boxing or just in, in, uh, in self-defense, he will probably stand more ground and he will talk to him a little bit more in a, in a more confident way. But if a person who, who is you know, also a small stature or something, but it doesn't have to go. I think even an old lady sitting in the, in the back row could have more courage than a guy who is a little bit more buff. So I think it, it doesn't really depend. It's, it's more about conviction. And this is um, what, what history showed us. Um, if, you, if I think back on, uh, uh, on, the, on the black uh, civil rights movement in the US when uh, Rosa Parks, she said, I'm not going off the bus. And this was the, the whole thing that started the bus segregation. She was just a woman. And they said, woman, you have to... Uh, give your seat away for the for the white man to sit, and she said, "No, I'm not uh, not today." So I think, in a way, I think we we have this ability to 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 surprise us. So I think it's 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 fair to say that a lot of people just act uh, on conviction or just on uh, on purpose because they say, "Now I gotta step in." That's the madness of crowds, when you do not know whether the others will follow you, and you don't know whether they will react in a way that punishes you. So there was a quote by, I, I don't know whom, it was a very wise person. So it was Nietzsche, maybe. I'm not, I'm not sure who was who said this. It was, if you, if you want to punish someone, punish them when they do something bad. But if you really want to punish them, punish them when they do something right. That completely destroys incentive structure. And if something, if someone does something wrong and they get, they get punished, cool. That's alignment of feedback and reality. But if they do something right 
and you, they get punished by the environment. You make a comment in the in the bus, in that that hypothetical bus during the segregation of the bus in the buses in the in the U.S. Hey, I think the, this girl sh- should be able to sit where she's sitting, and uh, the white person shouldn't have a priority here. If another person made that comment, now there will be two people in one side and not just one. So it's very important to have not only one person saying the what is considered to be crazy, but most of it by most of the people, but also having some other people who share your opinion, and you know that your your back is going to be covered by them. So if if a moment comes in which we have to defend that a black person should be able to sit here, let's make sure that enough of us are around so that others are more hesitant to escalate the conflict if it happens. Yeah, and I think that's uh, that's probably also why our environment shapes us in so many ways because uh, if we know that in our environment there are enough people to back us up, if if the guy you know charges um, to us. Um, towards us, that uh, they will also um, come come to, come to the aid of our uh, of ourselves. Then we are probably more willing to to escalate or to to do something. But if we know that uh, nobody's going no, nobody's going to 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 have this you know uh, uh, support for us, we'll probably be quieter or more reserved in a way, right? So I think, as I said in the beginning, I think we we um, our environment shapes us, but still we can also shape our environment. But still, environment is a big, big variable in in how we react and how we how we do something. And I think, uh, speaking back, it really depends also on the context, right? In a lot of in, in a lot of ways, uh, some people could be courageous in one way, and also courageous in not courageous in a, in another way, right? but be, still be the same person. I've realized that there's one which is the most powerful thought ever, which is, what is it? avoiding this thought or this expression that I'm communicating now to be the thing that changes your life in the direction of self-improvement. What if this was the thing that makes you realize, hey, there's a need for me to improve my life? Is, is there any constant of physics or any law of thermodynamics or like physics and something fundamental of the universe that has to be violated for you to make that realization out of this expression? I don't. I don't think that that, that has to be the case. I, I had the, made this realization in the past, so I want to make a very optimistic comment that maybe this is the thing that makes people realize. And in principle, there's nothing avoiding that. So whether these utterances that I'm making are the things that will end up changing the life of someone who's listening to, only depends on how they take it. So now it is in the hands of the people listening to this things I'm saying to whether they actually want to start changing their life in the direction of virtue you putting into a practice the alignment between feedback and reality that we have been talking until now or not so it's very powerful that you can make an explicit comment of the change that could occur that in principle is not blocked by anything okay. I tell you there's a way of improving your life and whether you want or not depends on you so you have an ability in principle to start wanting to want. And the wanting to want could eventually lead to you wanting. So let's say you get used to eating donuts. You will want the donut. But in the beginning, you could realize that, okay, I don't want to want donuts, but I want a donut. So you ditch the first one and you go through a short-term negative feedback of the craving of the donut because you really want it, but it, you know that it is the negative feedback in the short term that leads to you aligning what you want with what you want to want. You want to want to not eat the donut, but you want the donut. So that mismatch is exactly what I'm trying to make reference to and that nothing in principle avoids anyone from listening this, who, who is listening this, to start the, making that transition and improving their lives the most they can. Yeah, I think my closing thoughts uh, would also align to, into that. And I think um, no matter if we want or or, or not, I think uh, our lives going to be much, much different uh, from in 10 years from, from now. The question is just like in, in which way? And I think this is, the, this, is the, this is the part of equation if we think of a mathematic formula that, um, that we possess... To, to actually change 
because um, as uh, with example with Voltaire with the cards there's a lot of cards that are that, that we have but we have to play them we cannot keep them around and complain we have to take actions we have to we have to gather also the the courage and i think courage at its most core is just action just taking action and uh, not only action but also an action which uh, which uh, thinks also of the consequences because as we dis- as we discussed the future is now <laughs>